Psalm chapter number one, familiar passage if you've grown up in church or you've been around church for any length of time. And this is where we will be tonight, Psalm chapter number one, looking at the blessed life. And so when you found your place there in Psalm one, would you stand with me for the scripture reading? Psalm chapter number one. Psalm 1, and let's do this tonight just a little bit different. Let's read this aloud and together. So find, find your place there, Psalm chapter number 1, and hopefully you've had a chance to find your place there. Look at verse number 1, and let's read this out loud together. Ready, begin. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His lease also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the time that we have to open your word, to hear from you. And God, I pray that we would, uh, we would take in uh, these verses that are in front of us. I pray that we would apply wisdom uh, as, we, as we study them together. But then more than that, I pray that we would apply uh, these truths to our lives each and every day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, I remember memorizing that verse, I believe when I was in first grade, this passage, one of the first portions of Scripture that I've ever, that I ever memorized was Psalm chapter number one. And Psalm chapter number one outlines for us the blessed life, the blessed life. I was uh, thinking, I was, I was preparing for this message of a song that was popular back in 2009. And this song was atop the Billboard 100 charts. It was a song by the group One Republic. And the name of the song was The Good Life. The Good Life. And it did well. It actually went platinum four times, selling over four million albums. The music video has hundreds of mu uh, millions of views. And it's a song that just kind of resonates. It's a, it's a song that has uh, a, a feel-good nature to it. And it's a song that resonates the good life. And I think there's reason that this song was so popular. And I think part of that is is people want the good life, and people want to, to feel good. What I thought was ironic, though, about this song was a few years later, the lead vocal for the, the group, Ryan Teddy, posted on social media that he needed to pull back for a while. He said, I was hit with emotional, psychological wall. I was on the verge of a, ner a nervous breakdown, not sleeping. He said, I was on medication, anxiety to a crippling level. And then he said, I was just not happy. And so here's someone that puts together lyrics to a song that makes everyone else feel good. And, and yet happiness, even to this songwriter, was elusive. And how, how many of you have noticed that happiness in our world seems elusive? There's a lot of grumpy people out there. How many of you encountered a, just a grumpy person maybe in the last few days? And that happens from time to time, right? Happiness is elusive. Everyone seems to want the good life, but very few people seem to be living it. And then maybe you can ask yourself or you ask someone else, what would make you happy? And some people are very quick to jump to answers. Well, if I only had this, if I just had a promotion, if I just had maybe, uh, if I lived in a different neighborhood, if I had a little bit more money, if these relationships weren't stressed as they are. And so someone that's not happy, it's very quick to point to all the reasons they're not happy. And yet uh, happiness is elusive in our world. Happiness appears to be at an all-time low. There was a Time Magazine article that stated that happiness just isn't what it used to be. And this was a recent Time uh, Magazine article that happiness isn't what it used to be. There was another article that, that uh, used, coined the phrase, the great gloom. And we heard about the great resignation, but now there's the great gloom. And these are people that just feel stuck at the job. They can't, they can't go anywhere. And so there's, there's difficulty in that. And then 
Uh, we have our teens with us tonight. Teens are not exempt from this. There is a, there's a, an author that wrote a book that's coming out. I haven't read it yet, so this is not a recommendation. I read another one of her book, but this is Abigail Shire wrote a book called Bad Therapy. And I think it's interesting. She said, when I started Bad Therapy, as I always do with the question, why is the rising generation suffering so mightily? Why does a generation who has seen no world war, no Great Depression, no 9-11 plunge into a bottomless well of despair, right? Why is a, a generation that hasn't seen some of the great difficulties that previous generations do, why, why is there such difficulty in them? They received, that she goes on to say, more parental attention than the generations before. They are showered with mental health resources, and yet happiness seems elusive. Even in our founding documents, we read, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Life, liberty, guaranteed. Happiness, you're on your own, right? The pursuit of happiness. So people today seem to chase happiness and they come up short. Uh, there are even uh, comedians that are supposed to bring us joy, make us laugh, and sometimes they suffer the most. In fact, there's a, there's a, a, a paradox. It's called the sad clown paradox that many times people use humor as a coping mechanism. So this world offers an empty happiness, whereas God offers enduring joy and abundant blessings. As believers, we understand that there is something deeper than surface level happiness. And so this passage, we find the description of not just a happy individual. We understand that as believers, there's something deeper than just happiness, and that is, that is joy, and that is blessing. And so what we have in here is the description of someone who's not just living the good life, as the world would say, but living the blessed life. You see, true happiness is the byproduct of another pursuit. True happiness is the byproduct of another pursuit. True joy, happiness, blessing is found when we pursue God. And that's what we find here in Psalm chapter number one. So many are forecasting 2024 to be another unhappy year. And there, there are reports. It wasn't difficult to find the few samples I showed at the beginning. There are many reports like that where happiness is trending lower. But thankfully, as believers, we don't have to follow the trend. We can find blessing, fulfillment, meaning, purpose, and we can find that blessed life. So let's take a little closer look at the blessed life. The word blessed here that we read in Scripture together aloud a moment ago is plural, and it, spe it speaks to the multiplicity of blessings. It's not just a, a blessing in one singular area of your life, but to, to experience a fully blessed life. And so this is a rich word, uh, the word here blessed. And uh, C.H. Spurgeon said, It is not blessed is the king. Blessed, or blessed is the scholar, blessed is the rich, but blessed is the man. This blessedness is obtainable by the poor, the forgotten, the obscure, obscure, as by those names, figures, it is as attainable to the poor, the forgotten, the obscure, obscure, as by those names, figure in history and are trumpeted by fame. What is, what is Mr. Spurgeon saying here? He's saying uh, this blessedness is obtainable, right? It's not elusive. It's clearly found and clearly outlined here in the word of God. And it's just as attainable for the poor as it is the rich. So let's talk about this blessed man. So this blessed man in this passage or this blessed individual is described in a few different ways. And I want to draw your attention to them. First of all, this man is described, this individual is described by what he declines. So what does this blessed individual look like? Or what, what, is the, what are the marks of this blessed individual? First of all, we're, we're, our attention is drawn to what he declines. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the, sitter, the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So the blessed man, first, the first thing we notice in the passage is what he says no to. And what he declines. And what is it specifically that he declines? First of all, bad counsel. Bad counsel. Bad advice. He walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, Psalm chapter number one is like a fork in the road. And there's going to be two paths that are outlined here in this passage. There's, there's the way of the blessed man, and then there's the way of the ungodly. We are introduced and we are reintroduced throughout the book of Psalms to uh, the, the scorner, the wicked, or the ungodly here as we find in this passage. But we are shown these two paths, the paths of the, 
the, the godly that leads to spiritual prosperity and the path of the wicked which leads to destruction. And we are, we are reminded and uh, reacquainted with the wicked and the godly, ungodly all throughout the book of Psalms. So what, what, who is the ungodly or who is the wicked? Who are we speaking of? Or how would you define this group of, indi- people, of individuals? These are those whose whole life's direction is against God. The ungodly, the wicked, their entire life direction is against God. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, or getting and gleaning advice from someone whose entire direction is against God, against Scripture, against biblical values. The first and defining trait of the blessed individual is what he or she will decline, that he or she will decline bad counsel. Now, when it comes to counsel, people usually go wrong in one of two different ways. First of all, I don't listen to anybody. And some people make that mistake. And the Bible tells us that there's, there's safety in the multitude of counselors. So there's, there's always going to be some individuals, though, that are like, I, I don't listen to anyone. You can't tell me what to do. And that's one side of the road. That's one ditch that you can follow up in, in, in relation to counsel. But the other side is that I'm going to listen to everybody, no matter what. If it's Fox News or if it's TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or this person or that, I'm just going to soak it all in, right? And that's the other side of the road. That's the other ditch that you can fall into, right? So the blessed man, he's going to decline certain counsel and receive other counsel. If you want to be, depl- if you want to be blessed, you have to intentionally decline the wisdom of the world. The blessed individual will possess a wholesome disregard for the ways of the lost world. If you are in step with a corrupt culture, you are out of step with God. And so just think about this moment that we are. Think, think about the, the counsel of the wicked, the counsel of the ungodly as it relates to us today. I just jotted down a few examples. It is the counsel of the ungodly today that there is no absolute truth. It's... It's subjective. It's whatever you want. That's the counsel of the ungodly. And because there's no absolute truth, this is, this is your truth. You can go to church and you can read from this, but that's, there's no final authority in it. That's the counsel of the ungodly. The counsel of the ungodly speaks today that there is no value to human life. Human life's not sacred. And that's why we'll champion the causes of some endangered species above the cause of the unborn. And that's the counsel of the ungodly. I know I'm just cherry picking here. These are just a few. Uh, that human sexuality is fluid. When, when the Bible says he created male and female, right? But, but uh, the counsel of the ungodly would say you can be whatever you want to be, whenever you want to be. This is the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, uh, tolerance for everything except for what we're speaking of tonight. It's just tolerant of everything. This is the counsel of the ungodly. So the blessed individual declines that counsel. I'm going to decline the counsel of the ungodly. This is worldly counsel. What should we do as believers in response to worldly counsel? We should expose it and we should avoid it. Expose it and avoid godly counsels. Now, there, there are times that we're going to pop the hood uh, and we're going, to have some, we're going to have some conversations. We're going to teach maybe some of our teenagers or some of our college students. We're going to, we're going to have those discussions. But we're not, going to, we're not going to debate with the ungodly counsel, right? You can't. You're not going to get anywhere there, right? Uh, but we will, we, we, we will open God's word and we will, we will teach and show and counsel and receive questions. Uh, but for the, for the ungodly, we're not going to engage and reason with the ungodly. Why? Because the ungodly, their direction is wicked, their way is wicked. We need to expose it and to avoid it. So very simple application tonight here is, where are you getting your counsel from? Who is influencing your life? Every one of us must answer that question. Who is influencing your life? Um, the blessed individual will decline bad counsel or bad advice. The next thing that the blessed individual will do is, is uh, decline not just the bad advice, but bad companionship. So we see here, walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. So that first word walking speaks of, of course, getting counsel from the ungodly, but it also speaks of a direction. It's a direction. You're heading in a direction. We walk in a direction, right? We're always, if you're walking, you're always walking in a direction. So here, here's, there is a progression to this passage. Walking, not in the counsel of the ungodly. And then it says, 
nor standing in the way of sinners. Have you ever asked somebody, or maybe someone's asked you, where do you stand on this issue? That is, we're going to hear a lot of political debates this year, and you'll hear that over and over again. Where do you stand on this issue, right? And what they want is something a little bit more concrete than I'm, I'm just figuring out right now. It's a more settled position. So walking is a direction, standing now is, is more intentional, it's more settled. And so uh, the ungodly, they will entertain the counsel, uh, the blessed man will not entertain the counsel of the ungodly, uh, but also won't pull up and stop and, and listen. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. So when you are in step with bad counsel, the counsel of the ungodly, when you refuse to avoid it or uh, refute it, then it won't be long until you slow up and you linger and you hang out for a while. Now, this doesn't mean that you should avoid your unsaved coworker when, when we read here, as we read a moment ago, nor standing in the way of sinners, right? Uh, so you know someone at your workplace is not saved and you're at the water cooler and you're standing together for a minute and you're like, oh, I can't stand here, right? No, that's not what we're talking about, right? Jesus was called a friend. He was accused of being a, a friend of sinners and of the publicans, right? I think I, what, we, what, what the emphasis here is, is influence. Who's having the influence? And I think that's got to be an honest question that you answer for yourself in a relationship, especially with someone, maybe a coworker that doesn't know Christ, who is influencing who? And so the, the blessed man will decline bad counsel, bad advice, bad companionship, but then also bad conduct, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So there's some great lessons from this passage. And one of them is that sin is progressive. Clearly, standing is more settled than walking, and sitting is more permanent than standing. So sinful actions pave the way for more sinful actions, right? There's a progression to this passage. This passage exposes a couple lies from the devil. The first one is this, that we sin in isolation. This is just something that I do, and it only affects me, and it doesn't affect anyone else. And that's not true. It, uh, families have been ruined. Relationships have been destroyed. Jobs have been lost. We can go over, over and again on this by an individual, by individuals who, who thought they sinned just to themselves, right? We sin against God, and it has an effect on others. We don't just sin in isolation. So that's the first lie, that we sin in isolation. But then the other lie is that we, we can contain it. I can practice this sin, and it will never lead to anything else. And that's not how sin works. There's a progression to sin. So let's, let's recap, because many today occupy the seat of the scorner, those who, who mock biblical principles and biblical truths. So what are we talking about here? Bad counsel. This is bad advice, welcoming in every sort of uh, worldview and adopting every sort of idea. Uh, bad counsel, then that leads to bad companions. And this literally speaks of like stepping into someone else's shoes. So you're going to stand in place. You're going you're to ag walk in agreement with these individuals. Uh, adopt their lifestyle, their pattern of conduct. And then uh, it will lead to a fully, uh, a bad conduct, the, fully, uh, the full extent of this progression is, is to, to mock or scorn biblical values. Now, I will say our theme for this year is courageous. And so if we are going to decline bad advice, bad communications or associations and bad conduct, it takes some courage. This is not easy to do. It's not easy to do these things, to live countercultural as God has called, as Christ has called us to. And so the blessed man, is, his life is described here by what he declines, but not just what he declines. Let's look next. But his delight. So draw your attention with me to what he delights in. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, if you're going to want to experience the abundant blessings of God, there are some things that you're going to have to decline. You will never experience God's, but you will never experience God's blessing by only declining. Now, declining is the first step, and it is essential, but it's not just declining that leads to the blessed life. Some people brag about all the things that they don't do. 
I don't do this, or they feel good. Maybe they don't verbalize it. They feel really good about themselves because of all the things that they don't do. I don't do this, and I don't do this, and I don't stand here, and I don't walk here, and I don't sit over there, so I'm doing great. But that's not it. It's not it just to decline certain things. Here, the psalmist, I'm going to decline these things so I can say, I'm saying no to these things so I can say yes to these things. And this is something I know our teenagers are in the room, but we have to understand about the Christian walk. The Christian walk is not just a series of no's or things that we don't do. If all, all you pull away from your time in God's word tonight is that uh, we can't do this and we can't do this and can't do this, you're miss, missing the, the entirety of this passage. It's not just the things that you can't do. I'm not going to decline these things. I'm going to decline these things so I can delight in these things. That make sense, right? That's what the passage is outlining for us. So some people brag about all the things that they don't do. I don't do this, I don't do this, and I don't do this. But what do you do, right? What are you doing? What are you delighting in? The Christian life is not just a series of no. It's not just declining wrong. It's delighting in that which is right. See, there's a negative and a positive aspect to the blessed life. I remember uh, some years ago, I, I think it was 2010, 2011, there was uh, an NBA superstar named Michael Redd. And Michael Redd played for the Milwaukee Bucks. And he still holds some uh, scoring records to today. And amazing athletes. He was given a $91 million contract to play for the Milwaukee Bucks. He later went on to play for Team USA Basketball. He played alongside Kobe Bryant and LeBron James and really had an amazing career. Well, right after, right after he played for uh, uh, Team USA World Basketball, just not, not long after that, uh, my mom, my dad, and my brother were in the airport, and my brother spotted Michael Red. Michael Red's a believer, and he was there reading his Bible. And so Michael Red was there reading his Bible, and um, Matt was too nervous to go and talk to him. It's kind of a big guy there. And this is me. I'll, I'll tell you about this in just a second. But Matt, uh, Michael Red was kind of a big guy. Matt didn't want to talk to him. My dad didn't really want to talk to him. So my mom went and talked to Michael Red. And my mom went with him and said, are you, are you Michael Red?" And he looked up at my mom and said, yes, ma'am. And they began, began talking. And it wasn't long after that my dad began speaking with him. And some of you might remember Michael Red came to our church for a youth rally. And my dad was able to talk to him. And this is, this is the day that he flew out. What was cool about Michael Red? he came, we gave the gospel. There was a lot of people uh, that were able to, to hear the gospel and got saved. He was here Friday night. He spoke to our basketball team. He was here Saturday for an event. He was here on Sunday. It was such a unique experience for me to spend time with such an elite athlete, right? That's not something you'd usually get to do. To, to be able to spend some time, to share a meal, to share a conversation with someone who competes at such an elite level. But here's one of the things I figured out about Michael Red. There were some things that he declined, right? Uh, he didn't want to go to Taco Bell with me. You know, he was very particular in where he was going to eat. We did go to In-N-Out, right? And he ate some very healthy things at In-N-Out. He was very particular about the things he declined. Also, when he came, and this is his private jet before us when he was getting ready to fly out of town. But when he came, there were some things that he declined, but there were some other things that were very important to him. He wanted to know ahead of time what the fitness center at his hotel room was going to look like, right? So what enabled him to, peak, to perform at that peak level? It was the fact that he declined some things, and he delighted in other things. And because of that, he experienced in his career his blessing. Now, the blessed life for us as believers is outlined in Psalm chapter number one. There are some things that we have to decline, that we're going to say no to. But it's so that we can delight in other things. Now, what do we delight in here? But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Too often... Time spent in God's word is thought of a, a duty or worse, a drudgery. When's the last time you found yourself delighting in the word of the Lord? The, David wrote later in Psalms, the judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. It's clear that in David, when he wrote this, he only had the first five books of the Bible, but he delighted in them. There's another verse, Psalm 117, verse 7. Oh, how love I thy law it is my meditation all the day. 
So his delight it is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now this is not the idea of like Eastern meditation, where we're going to clear our minds and reach some sort of zen, right? We're going to just clear everything out. That's not what it means to meditate. It means to clear everything else out so we can focus intently on the Word of God. In fact, the word meditate speaks of, it's, a, it's like a cooing or like a uh, a, a cow chewing its cud will make that, that kind of low grunt or noise. Or, I mean, not just cows. We do this too, right? Like we're really liking something. How many of you ever had a meal that's your favorite meal and you're like, you, you get that first bite and you're like, mm, mm, that's good. That's what it means to meditate. We're going to meditate on it day and night and it's that, that, that satisfaction, right? So I'm going to meditate in the word of God. What does this mean? It means that we aren't just to read the scripture, we should feed on the scripture. Not just buzz through the passage so we can get a, a certificate at the end of the year, and that's commendable for sure. But let's dwell on the word of God. Let's feed on the word of God. So the blessed life is described by what this blessed individual declines, what this blessed individual then delights in, but then notice what he depicts. What does the blessed man depict? Next verse, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. If you want to experience God's blessing, if you want to have a blessed life, there's some things that you're going to have to decline. There's some other things that you're going to find delight in. That's the, that's the blessed man described here in Psalm chapter number one. But then what? What is, the, what is the visual depiction given of this blessed life? It's a tree. It's a tree. Uh, when we think of a tree, it's not a stump. It's not a, not a twig. Uh, we've, I've seen some impressive stumps in my life. Uh, uh, some of us have been up before to the Trail of the 100 Giants. Any of you ever been there before? At the Trail of the 100 Giants, there's a few trees that have fallen, and they've cut the stump. And just to see the stump, that's impressive. But we're not called to be like stumps. And we, we've all seen twigs. We're not called to see twigs. Why? Because those are dead. We're called to be alive. See, this denotes a few things. It denotes progress. To be a tree, the expectation of a tree, when you plant a tree and you water a tree, the expectation is that tree is alive. There's progress. I saw a picture. I think we have a couple pictures here of palm trees in L.A. And how many of you have driven like, down a road like this in Los Angeles? And there's a few in Burbank and a few in Los Angeles, these roads that are just lined with palm trees. I saw this picture a few days ago, and this is a picture of the trees when they were first planted, right? It's kind of neat to see that, but we also kind of expect it. This, this doesn't surprise you. It would surprise you if I went the other way. I'm like, they were this big when they were planted, and the next picture is like, they're short. You're like, wait, what happened? Something's wrong with those trees, right? It's, there's an expectation of, of growth, and so there is progress, and for the blessed life, it's not instantaneous, but there should be progress. How, how were you doing a year ago or a couple of years ago in terms of your time spent in, in God's word or your love for him? Is there progress? Is there marked progress? Then there's, there's permanence. It says he shall be like a tree that's planted, not just potted. Uh, I had some plants that were in my backyard and I got to most of them. I planted all of them, but there's one plant. Uh, it lived for quite a long time in the plot before I tried to plant it. And then when I tried, it didn't do very well uh, because it was, it was potted. There was no place for it to grow. There was no permanence. I could pick up and I could, I could move that plant around. That was a neat feature that none of my other plants had. That plant I could move around, but there was no permanence to it. To be like a tree uh, planted by the rivers of water, water, there's progress and then there's permanence. I think of this phrase, planted by the rivers of water. We planted some trees in our backyard, and one of the trees, I saw the tree, some of my favorite trees here on campus, and don't we have some beautiful trees on campus? Some of my favorite trees are right behind the Revels building. I love those trees. I love the colors. They turn in the fall. So I asked someone, like, what kind of trees are those? And I found out they're raywood ashes. Beautiful, cool tree. So I planted two of them in my backyard, one on this side and one over on this side. But I've noticed as they've grown and we've had them five, six, seven years now, one of the trees is much taller than the other one. And I figured out it had to do with the water pressure. This tree is closer to the water. The water pressure is higher. This tree is further away, and it's a little bit shorter than the other. It's still doing okay, but this one is planted by the rivers of water. And so your environment matters. Your connection group matters. 
The friends that you keep matters. Where you find yourself planted. So get planted because planting is permanent, but get planted by the rivers of water. Get yourself planted in an environment where it will grow. I'll show you another tree that this is this for a time was my favorite tree in Lancaster. I really got a kick out of this tree. This was off of Avenue J and Sierra Highway. And I noticed this tree, if you see the backside of it here, this tree was growing up through a traffic sign. Like the tree, I don't know how this, this is like a, a modern miracle, right? Uh, this tree growing through a traffic sign. And I, I spotted that tree when it was just a young sapling. I became attached to this tree. This is my favorite tree. I'd drive, I'd watch this tree, and I'd see the tree kind of grow, and the next year I'd wait for it, and it would it'd be a little bit bigger. But the reason I watched is I knew what would happen. I knew eventually that tree would get strangled out. Why? Because it wasn't planted in the right spot. It wasn't planted by the rivers of water, right? It's Avenue J, not the rivers of water, right? It was not planted by the rivers of water. It was planted inside of a traffic sign. It, it, it became constricted and it couldn't grow. Get connected. Find yourself. And I know I'm speaking to the midweek crowd here. Like, this is what you're doing tonight. You're planting yourself close to the word of God so that way you can grow. Get planted. And you know what we should do as a church family? We should help others get planted. I am thankful for longtime members of Lancaster Baptist Church, some of them who taught me Sunday school, some of them who I wrote on your bus route, Brother Downey, I'm thankful for some men and women of God who got planted by the Word of God, fed by the Word of God, refreshed by the Spirit of God, and they're planted. And they help others get planted as well. So there's permanence in this. There's, uh, there's not just permanence, there's progress. And then, and then we see there's productivity. So we read this verse again. Planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. Uh, Jesus said at one point, you shall know them by their fruit. What is the fruit? It is the evidence of growth. It is the outward evidence of growth. I think primarily of the fruit of the spirit. I think of the, the fruit of, of souls. And it's the evidence of growth. Uh, that inward growth make, being made manifest. But you know what uh, fruit also is? It's enjoyment. There's nothing like Right? Cold watermelon on a hot summer day. It's the evidence of growth, but there's also enjoyment in it. I think of Genesis chapter number 12. Uh, God speaking to Abraham. I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. There's a song. I don't know hardly any of the lyrics of the song, except for I've been blessed to be a blessing. Any of you heard that song before? I've been blessed to be a blessing. So the blessed life doesn't end with that individual's life. If you really want to experience God's blessing in your life, you're going to bear some fruit in your life. And that's something that, that the Holy Spirit brings. Like, we don't bear fruit, but we can make sure that the environment is right to bring that fruit. And so there's productivity to it. There's blessing. Uh, if you've been, I know uh, several of you here in this room have been to the Holy Lamb. And in one day, you can drive and see two uh, pretty awesome but very different bodies of water. The first is, you can see the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is beautiful. Depending on the time of the year, the location where you're standing, it's green, it's lush, and it's beautiful. But you go a little bit further south and a little bit lower, and it starts to get a little bit hotter, and there's another sea, and this is the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is kind of dead, right? There's not much, much to it. Well, what's the difference? Here's the difference. That the Sea of Galilee, there's, a, there's an inlet. You can look at it in a map. You can, even on the, your Bible map in the back will show there's a river that goes in and there's a river that goes out. There's an inlet and there's an outlet. But what about the Dead Sea? There's an inlet, but there's no outlet. And the blessed life is someone who, who, who is blessed to be a blessing. There's an inlet and then there's an outlet. How are you being a blessing to others? How are you in response to God's blessing in your life, looking for other ways to be a blessing to others. So uh, the blessed life is marked by what he declines, what he delights in, what he depicts, and then finally notice with me what, how he differs, how he differs. We continue reading. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. You know, sometimes we like to complicate things. But Psalm chapter number one is pretty clear. There's this path and there's this path. There's this way and then there's this way. There's the way of the blessed and then there's the way 
of the ungodly. The ungodly, they're not snow. So everything that we read in verses 1, 2, and 3 about the, about the godly, the blessed life, uh, what the psalmist is saying here is the exact opposite of, is true of the ungodly. So everything that we said of the blessed life, the, the exact opposite of is true in the ungodly. They're not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. I think I have a picture of someone sorting through the chaff. This is in Africa. And we've heard this before, but the chaff and, and the, the wheat is thrown into the air and the chaff is separated from the wheat. The chaff is lightweight and is blown. By, by design, this is why they're doing this because what's worthless, what's meaningless, what doesn't really matter is driven away by the wind, right? There's no, it just, wherever the wind is blowing, if it's swirling, if it's blowing east, the chaff's, chaff is going east. If it's blowing west, likewise. But the chaff is separated from the wheat. So the chaff, it's that, it's that lightweight little husk that surrounds what's actually valuable. The wicked, the ungodly are not so, but they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. The culture driving every which way, and the chaff just follow, follow, follow. But the blessed life are, 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 are not so. They're not like that. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sitters in the con- sinners in the congregation of the unrighteous. So now we look ahead, and we can see a little bit further down this path. For God knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And here we go. We can peer down this path a little bit further to see the end. We see the blessed life. We see uh, the blessings that come and then the ability to be a blessing to others. And then we see further down this path and we see just destruction. It couldn't be more clear and we'll end with this. Everyone look at verse number one and the first word. What's the first word? It's blessed. It's blessed. But go to the end of chapter number one, verse number six. What's the last word? Perish. I want to have a blessed life. I know you want to have a blessed life. And while our world chases after happiness and fulfillment and meaning, God's word offers abundant blessing. And there are moments where we look ahead and it it seems like the wicked are prospering and it seems like everything's going their way. Uh, But Psalm chapter number one is for us, it's a guiding light. It's a good reference point for us. And so, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also, I skipped over this, shall not wither. It's obvious when something's dying, isn't it? And the leaf is turning brown and it's withering. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The blessed life. The blessed man is marked by what he declines, what he says no to, uh, what he delights in, what he depicts, and then how he differs. Let's have a word of prayer.